If you've been listening to the news, you've heard uh, about globalism, globalism, the one world government that's coming, and it is, and it's coming out in the open now, and so we're on the verge of prophecy being fulfilled to the letter, amen. Amen. Now, Nebuchadnezzar, I'll call him Neb for short, had a dream. And in this dream, he saw a vision and an image. And nobody could interpret the dream, and so we had them all killed. That's what I call a good prophet. I mean, a good uh, politician, false prophet, whatever. But there was one by the name of Daniel that could uh, tell Neb his dream and interpret it. Now, that's what I call a true prophet of the Lord. Of course, let me say something here before we go to Daniel chapter 2. The main prophecies in the Bible is the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, which happened. But Daniel's book is second to all the prophecies in the Bible besides Revelation. Daniel's runs a tight second in prophecy. Now, in the Bible, one-third of the Scripture is prophecy, and so we need to delve into it from time to time and take heart because it's going to come to pass like the Word of God says. So when was this written? It was written, according to historians and theologians, in 536 B.C., so 25, 2,600 years ago, uh, it was written by inspiration, and we're beginning, and really are we seeing a lot of these things that Daniel prophesied coming to pass. Amen. Now, let's look at verse 19 of chapter 2 then. Amen. Amen. Then was the secret revealed to Daniel in the night vision, and Daniel blessed the God of heaven. Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, for wisdom and might are his. He, that's God, changes the times and the seasons. He moves kings, sets up kings, gives wisdom unto the wise, and knowledge to them that know understanding. So the Godhead actually controls all things sets up, tears down, as he sees fit. Anyway, we drop down to verse 28. There is a God in heaven that reveals secrets and makes known to to the king Nebuchadnezzar what shall be in the latter days. Everybody say latter days. Thy dream and the visions of thy head upon thy bed are these. And then he goes to explain to Neb about these visions. Now look at Daniel chapter 12 and verse 4. So this is short and sweet tonight. Everybody say praise the Lord. Thank you. Daniel 12, um, 4. But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book, even to the time of the end... We're in that time. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. Now, knowledge is doubled in every few years. It's, it's amazing how that can be possible, but it is happening just like Daniel said it would. So Daniel was writing down uh, the Scripture, and then God told him to, to seal the book until the time of the end. Then, of course, in the time of the end... Things would be revealed to us because we'll see it unfolding right before our eyes, which helps us understand the prophecy that Daniel recorded. So Daniel's book is in the most astounding revelation, really, other than the prophecies of the crucifixion and resurrection. And the amazing thing about the book of Daniel is that he starts with Nebuchadnezzar himself. See? Let's put up 
the image of the head of gold, if we could find that one. So, the head of gold, this, this is a depiction of the image that, uh, I don't want the one with the, rock, with the rock, I'm sorry. The other one. Thank you. Well, that's a rock too. Put it back to the first one then, I don't care. <laughs> We've already spilled the beans here, all right? So, Daniel said to Nebuchadnezzar, you're the head of the gold, and of course, your kingdom. And so we start with the head of gold. But the amazing thing about this prophecy is that uh, this image represents different kingdoms that's to follow the first one. And it goes all the way down to the feet. So the, fu- the feet uh, deals with the future. Amen. Now, in view of the fact that all these different kingdoms have come and gone, let's just know God's in charge. And he's going to have the, uh, the feet come out just like he wants. So the head of gold um, is what I just explained. Then we get down to the breast, the arms of silver, and that represents uh, the Medes and the Persians. So these are different kingdoms that come and go, and they get weaker as it goes down toward the feet. But anyway... Uh, One arm is over the other arm, representing uh, one of the two kingdoms, more strong, more um, influential than the other one. Then we get to the belly and the thighs of brass, which represent Greece under Alexander the Great. You've all heard of Alexander the Great, right? He died at 33 years old of alcoholism and syphilis. Mm -hmm. That's what I call a good leader. Well, his empire goes down. Then we get down to the legs of iron, which represent the Roman Empire that was not yet intact yet. So all these things are dealing with the future from Daniel's point, but deals with our past where where we are, except the bottom part of it. Now, the legs of iron, Roman Empire, and notice there's two legs. So what happened is Rome split eastern and western divisions just exactly like the prophecy was given. Now, we get down to the feet. Let's see if we can find the feet then, okay? All right. There's, aren't they beautiful feet? Beautiful. But we know that iron cannot mix with clay. So one's going to have the preeminence over the other. And many believe that this is the future of the revised Roman Empire. Some term it as revived, revived, revised. What's the difference? Uh, Rome will come alive again in the latter days, the last days. So the clay then represents, according to many scholars, the masses of people, and then the iron represents government that's over the people. And we're right there where this global government thing is getting ready to take over the world. By the way, it's been uh, foretold by many uh, economists that by the year 2030, we'll own nothing and the government will run everything. I hope that's not true, but there will be a one-world government. You can take it to the bank and write it down. Uh, And so it shouldn't shock the saints that are saved because um, there's good news. Amen. Now, we get down to those ten toes. The ten toes in this image, where's those feet at? Oh, thank you. The ten toes, everybody say ten, represent ten kings and ten kingdoms. Okay? Simple. Now, I don't know what the little toe represents other than it's one of the, one of the ten that will rise to the occasion in the Roman Empire. And many think that this could mean ten regions of the earth. Uh, I'm not going to debate it. We just had the ten toes, and that's the way that God's going to bring it about. And however it is, it's okay with me, all right? 
Now, we get to Daniel 8 and 9. Let's see if we can find this one. So now we, we briefly got down to the toes. Okay. Now we can put the rock, one up about the rock crushing the toes. All right. There it is. So we have the gold, the silver, bronze, the iron, and then Christ, who is the stone, by the way, comes back and crushes the feet of the image, causing all the empires to crumble and fall. Can I have an amen? That's in the future. Amen. It will happen at least seven years from today. Now, where does I say to go to Daniel 8 and 9? Let's look at this. Okay. Now to one of them came forth a little horn and wax exceeding great toward the south, toward the east, toward the pleasant land. The, the, the little horn is the Antichrist. Okay? Everybody say Antichrist. Now, he must be alive and being groomed right now by, by evil spirits and things to take over the global system that's trying to manifest at this time. Now, in verse 23 of that same chapter, okay, drop down there. In the latter time, everybody say latter time, of their kingdom, when the transgressors are come to the full, a king of fierce continents, and understanding dark sentences, shall stand up, Antichrist, and his power shall be mighty, but not by his own power. You got that right. It's from Satan. And he shall destroy wonderfully and shall prosper and practice and shall destroy the mighty and the holy people. So this is what's coming. And these ten nations will be involved in this uh, upheaval. Amen. Amen. It's fast approaching, but what I really want to focus on is the rock. Everybody say rock. The rock that comes from heaven and smashes the image. That's what we want to think about now. You can study this out later. There's a lot to it. I'm just skimming it. But in uh, 1 Corinthians 10.4, praise the Lord. We have a hint about who the rock is. And they all drink the same spiritual drink, for they drink that, that spiritual rock, and that followed them, and that rock was Christ. That rock was Christ. That rock was Christ. And then in Mark chapter 12 and verse 10, have you not read this? The stone which the builders rejected is become the head of the corner. So here again, Jesus is referred to as a stone or the rock. Amen. Then in Luke 20 and verse 17 to 18, St. Luke, where are you at? Luke 20, 17, and he beheld them and said, What is this that is written, that stone which the builders rejected, the same has become the head of the corner? And then verse 18, Whosoever shall fall upon that stone shall be broken, but on whomsoever it shall fall, it shall grind him to powder. And what we're saying is when the rock comes from heaven, it's going to grind this image to powder, and there'll be nothing left. So Christ is going to come, and take completely over. Amen. He is not a conscientious objector. At this time, he will be the King of kings and Lord of lords, and he will judge. Amen. So now, the rock that's hewn out of the mountain without hands, uh, which lets us know that human beings have nothing to do with the rock. The rock comes from heaven. The rock is Jesus. He will come back and smash the ten toes. Now, that would be pretty uh, painful if he stepped on our toes. But he's going to crush these ten kingdoms 
and take completely over. Amen. So I'm looking forward to that time. And to refresh your pure minds tonight, this cannot take place until after the rapture and after the seven-year great tribulation. Amen. But time's clicking fast, fast, fast. The months have turned into years fast. But fear not, children of God, um, we'll be in heaven when we experience this rock coming down. The good thing about this is that, from what I understand, we will accompany the rock a little bit. Uh, Revelation 1.7, the Bible says, Behold, he comes with clouds. So when Jesus comes back from heaven, he comes with clouds, and every eye shall see him. Now, this is talking about the second coming when the stone comes back to smash the ten kingdoms and, and take over the, the kingdoms of this world. They will soon become the kingdoms of our God. Amen. And every eye will see him. Now, in the rapture, every eye does not see him. But in this event, every eye will see him. And they which pierced him and all the kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, Amen. So what happens when he comes back is Revelation 19, verse 11 to 16. I saw heaven open, and I've been doing quite a bit of research about, I know you think I'm lost it, but rifts, dimensions, portals, et cetera, et cetera, and they're all over the earth. Do some research. In fact, I'd like to go out to Arizona and find that one that the government has sealed off. Would you go through it? I don't know. You see, what they're concerned about is they can't control the entities that come back to it. Many think it's Nephilim and the Watchers. Woo! And so, I don't know, would you go through a Stargate? Would you go through one? Monty, would you walk through one? If I knew God was on the other side, yeah, I'd go through, wouldn't you? But uh, the unknown is left unknown until God makes it known, all right? But there are such a thing as rift between dimensions, and, and God is multidimensional. We don't know how many dimensions God monitors at the same time. It's beyond our comprehension. How can it be? God is God. Amen. Well, this is what's going to happen then when the stone comes down that's cut out of the mountain, not made with hands. Uh, and I saw heaven open, verse 11, and behold, a white horse. Those are depiction that Chanel, uh, your mom, daughter, granddaughter, that she, pin she painted that picture right there. I don't know if it's completed, but it's good enough to give the message. And that, that's very close to how it's going to be. Very close to how it's going to be. I saw a white horse. He that set upon him is called faithful and true and righteous. He judges and, he, he judges and makes war. Amen. His eyes were flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no man knew, but he himself. He was clothed with a vesture of depth and blood, and his name is called the Word of God. The armies which are in heaven, that's us. Well, what about the angels? They're included. <laughs> they followed him on white horses, clothed with fine linen, white and clean. Now I'm thinking about a person that I knew. He's gone to be with the Lord many years ago. He had a vision of being lost in the desert, no water. He prayed to God, and God sent him a horse. The horse ran up to him and just stopped Beautiful stallion, white horse. And he said, God, thank you for the horse, but I don't have a saddle and a bridle. And so the Lord said, look to your left, and there was a saddle and a bridle on this fence. And so he got the saddle and the bridle, put it on the horse. When he put the bridle and the horse, you know how you got to pry their mouth open to open? Well, this horse just, just grabbed it. Perfect fit, put it on. Then he, he, he attempts to get on the horse and ride off, and he had... Dirt on his boots. He said, God, I'm not worthy to ride your horse. And so he unsaddled 
the horse, slapped the horse, the horse took off running, and that was it. And then he said, there he stood. He said, now what am I going to do? He said, God, I never even asked if I could borrow your horse. I never even, I wasn't worthy to, to ride. The Lord said to him, son, that's your horse. So I believe these things. He said, that's your horse. And, and this man said, well, you have a multitude of horses in heaven. How will I find him? The Lord said, don't worry, that horse will find you. It's just, folks, it's more real than we can even get a hold of. Talk about riding. I can ride, praise God. I don't know about flying, but I can ride a horse that can fly. Well, you're going to fly. You're going to fly through the air with the greatest of ease on a white horse following the stone, the rock of offenses. Man, when Jesus comes back, oh, our Lord's coming back to earth again. Yes, our Lord's coming back to earth again. Satan will be bound a thousand years. We'll have no tempter then. When our Lord returns to earth again, praise God. I'm looking forward to that time. There'll be no more crying in the ghettos, no more abortion. Huh? No more evil. When the stone returns, praise God. John said, even so, Lord Jesus, come quickly. Amen. Well, I didn't get through reading that. Where did I stop at here? All right, let's look at verse 14 then. And the armies which were in heaven followed him on white horses. So you got to fly. Clothed in fine linen, white and clean. Now, you know that represents the saints. Yes. See? And now it's talking about Jesus 15. Jesus is not some pushover. No. No. Mm -mm. Out of his mouth goes a sharp sword. With it, he, did, he should smite the nations. You talk about power. The ten toes don't have a chance. He should smite the nations and rule them with a rod of iron. And he treads the wine presses of the fierceness of the wrath of Almighty God. Who are we talking about? Verse uh, 16. He has on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. That's who he is. Praise God. When he comes back this time, it'll not be to go to a whipping post. It'll not be going, going back to being nailed to a, a dogwood tree again. No. They'll not drag him before Pilate. Pilate will be drugged before him. He's coming back as a judge. Now, here's the deal. He's either a savior now or he's going to be the judge later. Well, I'll take him as a Savior and Lord. Praise God. I, I shudder to think what's going to happen to those that reject King Jesus. There's no excuse for not being converted. None. We have Internet. We have TV, radio. We got uh, some good ministers here and there, decent churches all over the place. And yet, people are still going their own way and doing their own thing. But there will come a time, like the days of Noah, it will be a worldwide panic. Then in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 7 to 9, okay, And to you who are troubled, rest with us. You know, if we didn't know the Lord, it'd be a terrible time to live right now. I mean, you go down $8 for some Oreo cookies, hey, give me a break. I mean, we'd buy our own cow and start milking her, getting our own milk, but the feed costs so much. Well, inflation, it's going to implode everybody. Sooner or later, it's going to implode. So get out of debt. Amen. If 
If it implodes before the rapture, we can all live in the church and fight like cats and dogs, okay? I mean, we could if we had to. We can adapt. We're missionaries, right? We can adapt. Don't worry about it. God's going to take care of us one way or the other. Amen. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. This is not the rapture. Now, look at verse 8. I'm still talking about the stone coming down and going to destroy the image, which was Daniel's future and our future, and yet all the image has come to pass except this. And this is fastly approaching now, right now. You ought to be rejoicing. Look up. Lift up your head. Amen. Our redemption's drawn nigh. It must be so. Praise God. He's going to come back from heaven with his mighty angels. Why? In verse 8, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. That is not the rapture. The common sense tells us that's the second coming of Christ, which is the stone that comes down and smites the image. Praise God. That's the second coming. Amen. And then verse 9, it gets worse. Who shall be punished with everlasting destruction? From the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His power. That's what's going to happen. That's what's in store for this world, everybody. So I suggest you listen to me. Come out of the world and be separate, saith the Lord. Touch not the unclean thing, and then God will receive you into himself. He'll be your God, and you'll be his sons and daughters. Amen. Amen. You refuse to come out of the world system, you're not going to make it. You won't. Because Satan is the one that's got a death grip on the world system. You can't serve two masters. Amen. Amen. The Lord's going to take care of us, but he requires a few things. We're not going to bend to the devil. Amen. Last scripture tonight in Revelation chapter 20 is I'm still talking about the rock coming down from heaven. Revelation 20 verses 1 to 3 is the last verse tonight. Praise the Lord. This is what's going to happen. doesn't matter whether people believe it or not. This is what's going to happen. Amen. I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. He laid hold of the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil, and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. I got news for the amillennial people. The devil is not bound at this time. <laughs> it's just ridiculous. He's on the loose, going to and fro ever since Job, you know. I mean, ever since Cain could label it's, it's been bad news for the human race. But there is coming a big change, and I might say, Al Gore, there will be a global warming. <laughs> big time. You're right. <laughs> that won't be for over a thousand years. Amen. God will not allow nuclear war to destroy the human race. He reserves that for himself. But yet there'll be a remnant that comes through the fire. We're going to escape it all. Yes, it is the great escape. Well, the last part of this verse says, and cast him or the devil into the bottomless pit and shut him up. So there must be a dimension, a rift, a door, huh, to another dimension. And shut him up and set a seal upon him, and he should not deceive the nations no more. So Satan is the one that deceives the nations, not God. And he will be in the bottomless pit till the thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that, he must be loosed a little season. So after the money I'm then, Satan will be loosed out for a short season. There'll be a little war, and God will take care of it real quick. And then we're going to go into paradise and future eternity 
even though time will never end. Oh, time's going to be no more. No, time will never end. Laws be day and night, season. But in the New Jerusalem now, we'll not need the sun because Jesus will be the light of that city. Praise God. Hallelujah. Folks, the best is yet to come. Cheer up now. I'm not looking for no antichrist. We're looking for the Christ. Praise God. He will appear to those that look for him. Amen. Okay, let's stand up tonight. What do you say? Praise the Lord. It's just enough to get us where we're going to study Daniel. Well, we need to study Daniel because all through the book of Daniel, I'm telling you, there's prophecies there that will just make your hair stand up. Praise God. And it's all going to come to pass just like the Word of God says. This is where our faith must be anchored. How many love Jesus tonight? Praise God. God bless your hearts.